Welcome to the Inner Fire Podcast. We're glad you're with us today and welcome to 2022. Uh, we've got a great podcast lined up for you to start off 2022. We're going to be talking with Kelvin Cochran. He made national news when he was fired from his job for living out his faith. Uh, he's written a book about that that we reference in the podcast called Facing the Fire. I would encourage you to, to read that book to get more detail on his life. It goes into more depth than what we were able to cover in the podcast. If you're not familiar with Kelvin's story, we're going to play about a three-minute clip before we get into the podcast that uh, will kind of give some context to the podcast and the things that we discuss. So hope you enjoy that part. The podcast was recorded in Virginia at the Alliance Defending Freedom Studios there. Uh, Kelvin currently works for them, and that's where we met him. Uh, so you'll see that in the podcast as well. If you're not familiar with Alliance Defending Freedom, they are really on the front lines of protecting our right to live out our faith. Check out and connect them with them as well. But right now, enjoy the podcast. When I was growing up in Shreveport, the grown-ups asked us all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answers were always the same. I told them that I did not want to be poor because we were very poor, that I wanted a family because my dad had left my mother, and that I wanted to be a firefighter. Being one of the first African Americans on the Shreveport Fire Department had significant challenges. There was a designated bed in the dormitory for the black firefighter. We had designated plates, forks, and spoons so that no one would eat from the same plates, forks, and spoons of the black firefighter. It gave me a conviction that should I ever be in a position of leadership, that I would never allow anyone to have the same experience I had as a minority. And so when I became fire chief, I instituted having no racism, sexism, territorialism, favoritism, uh, cronyism, or uh, any ism that would interfere with a wholesome work environment for any people group within the fire department. Eight years after serving as fire chief in Shreveport, I was appointed fire chief in the city of Atlanta. President Obama was elected and he appointed me to the highest fire official in the United States of America, the United States Fire Administrator. And I loved that job and was serving there for about 10 months. The city of Atlanta elected a new mayor and recruited me back to the city of Atlanta. And I served him for five years when I was terminated from employment. Given the efforts that uh, myself as Fire Chief of Atlanta and our group put together uh, in creating this inclusive, diverse, uh, tolerant organization, I was really surprised that writing a book for a Christian men Bible study, 162 pages encouraging men to be the husbands and fathers and leaders that God has called us to be, uh, would put me in an adverse position against the city of Atlanta because of a few pages I wrote explaining biblical marriage and biblical sexuality. In fact, the city of Atlanta conducted an investigation and found out that I had never discriminated against anyone. However, I was terminated after my 30-day suspension in spite of that. After having lived a life of discrimination, providing leadership that eliminates discrimination was a high priority for me. So having been terminated for the perception of discrimination was very, very hurtful and really drives my passion for seeking justice and the fight for truth. Chief, it is so glad to have you on the Interfire podcast. Uh, so good to have you here. Uh, just thank you for taking the time to join us today. And, uh, you know, the video that we played kind of has given everybody a context for your story. Uh, it's an amazing story, what you have withstood and what you've been through. And so we just want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Tell us, uh, tell us where you're at and what you're doing. Well, first of all, thank you, Scotty, for uh, the opportunity to be on your podcast. I, I love the name of the ministry, Inner Fire. And uh, being a fire guy, it just resonated with me. Absolutely. So, yeah. 
but uh, currently I am uh, serving as Senior Fellow and Vice President of Alliance Defending Freedom, and uh, uh, my responsibilities are uh, working with the Church and Ministry Alliance team to increase participation in that uh, much-needed program. We have a Generational Wins Prayer Initiative where we are recruiting 10 million uh, intercessors to pray for what we call the generational wins, religious liberty, freedom of speech, marriage and family, the sanctity of life and parental rights. Uh, and internally, I am uh, working with HR to develop a professional development program for our team, uh, leadership, coaching, strategic planning. And uh, also one of my most excited projects is to build a national deployment strategy to respond on behalf of believers who are attacked for living out their faith. Okay, I want to ask you about a couple of those things. On the, the prayer initiative that you're doing, how do people get involved with that? Uh, if they want to become a prayer partner, can you just give us a, a, a instructions on what to do there? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> to be a part of the Generational Wins Prayer Initiative, uh, simply go to uh, a search engine and uh, type in alliance, excuse me, adflegal.org mm-hmm. forward slash prayer. Uh, the screen will pop up and on the uh, website for the Generational Wins Prayer Initiative, there'll be a button that says join, click that button and it'll walk you through the process. There's two categories that uh, the, the listeners can participate a catalyst is the category for organizations who want to join the prayer initiative and sign on the members of their organizations. A mobilizer is simply an individual who wants to join uh, and may be inclined to recruit other individuals to be a part of it. So it's less than 60 seconds mm-hmm. to become a part of that community of 10 million intercessors. Very good. And I want to let you know that Interfire Ministries is going to sign up as a catalyst for a part of that prayer initiative. Awesome. Uh, we want people t- to get involved in this. Uh, from, a, from a spiritual perspective, talk to us just a little bit about why you think people need to get involved with what ADF is doing. Uh, you know, Some people are hesitant to get into any kind of political issues or whatever, but uh, what's your perspective on that? Well, prayer is not political. Uh, at- all believers, uh, people of faith, even beyond the Christian faith, who have uh, a stake in our desire to live in a society where they can freely live out their faith, uh, freedom of religion, who want to live in a society where they can speak about what they believe without consequences, freedom of speech, uh, believers who want to live in a society where they can live out their values on family and marriage according to the scripture without consequences, uh, who want to, uh, who embrace and want to speak about in in private or publicly their views on the sanctity of life from conception to natural death, and members of our society who want uh, to raise up their children in the way that they should go according to the scripture, all have a stake in the Generational Wins Prayer Initiative and in Alliance Defending Freedom. And if they believe in all five of those things, it just makes them a great partner and ally for Alliance Defending Freedom. Well, prayer, you know, I, I've been involved with uh, ADF uh, for a little while now. Prayer is central to everything that ADF does. I greatly appreciate them for that. Uh, you know, it's, it's trying to integrate our faith into our lives. Prayer is a big part of that. And so, <clears throat> You said uh, in your book, which I highly recommend to people if they have not gotten a copy of the book, to get it and read it. Uh, it tells your story. Uh, there should be an encouragement to anyone who reads that, so just encourage people to do that. In the book, you noted uh, that you know taking on a more serious approach to spiritual disciplines really was a turning point in your marriage and your life. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? And you know what should Christians be doing from a spiritual discipline standpoint? Scotty, that's a great question. Uh, I'm one of those believers. I was saved when I was very, very young and baptized uh, when I was young. I knew what I was doing, so it's not like I went into it untrained or unadvised. But I wasn't walking that walk, uh, certainly as a kid. And when I reached what I call my terrible 20s, uh, things really got uh, bad. Uh, so bad that my own, the consequences of my own bad decisions brought me to a point in place Well, I surrendered at that point, I wholeheartedly surrendered my life 
to the Lordship of Christ. Uh, and even from the point of that conviction to the point of the transformation, it, there was a, it takes time. Sure. But one of the things I knew I had to do was spend time with God every day. Hmm. I, I knew I had more control over the first part of my day than the rest of my day. So I committed the first part of my day to spending time with God in prayer and reading the Bible. And I committed to doing that every day. And that was about 30 years ago uh, or more. And uh, God has, it's really transformed my entire life. You know, I'm a big uh, a big advocate for doing the same thing. Uh, I can speak personally that even though I served, uh, even on staff at church, when I was not regularly doing that, but when I began to do that, it had the same effect in my life. Uh, it just made uh, my whole spiritual life more real and everything else I was doing. And so, you know, when we talk about integrating faith, I hope people understand you can't, you can't do it without spending that personal one-on-one -on -one time with God in the Word, in prayer. Uh, so just uh, appreciate your perspective on that. Um, I had the opportunities to see you speak down in Orlando back earlier in the year, really enjoyed that. One of the things that really stuck with me out of that was you said that when people are, are truly living out their faith, they should expect persecution. Uh, that's not something we really want to hear a lot about as Christians. Uh, we want the feel good stuff. Talk a little bit about why we should expect persecution and what that might look like. Oh, absolutely. You know, the Christian walk of faith, as I explain it, is comprised of a series of level plains, mountain climbs, and valleys mm -hmm. throughout our life. In fact, the Bible says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. But there's a part of that process called cultivation that precedes seed time. We get excited when we hear the biblical promises about bearing fruit, uh, but we don't uh, consider that to get to the fruit bearing level, there has to be cultivation and then seed time and then fruit bearing harvest. Well, the cultivation season is where the difficulties come. And uh, when we experience cultivation, uh, we begin to make up statements like the devil is after me, or we begin to think about our own flesh and the God is punishing me. Uh, but cultivation is a part of the walk of faith, the journey of faith. And the good news for believers is that cultivation, seed time, and harvest are all under the sovereign supervision of God. So when we're going through those difficult seasons, we really should rejoice because God is cultivating us to prepare us for seed time. And then after seed time, it's harvest time. And so what I've come to realize is that rather than having a pity party or sinking in a state of despair, uh, when we, knowing that we are God's children, when we begin to go through those difficult seasons where they are what I call self-inflicted, whether you brought it on yourself or whether they are God allowed, God is just doing it because he has some plans for you. We should rejoice in the season of cultivation because God is preparing us for seed time. And after seed time, it's harvest time. Absolutely. Well, you know, I live on a farm, and so I have the privilege of watching the farmers. I, I don't do the farming myself, uh -huh. we, we, but we have our land is in cultivation by some other guys. Uh -huh. So I have the opportunity to watch that. And one thing I have observed <clears throat> is that harvest time is a much shorter period of time yeah, yeah. <laughs> than all that cultivation and all that patience and waiting and growing. Mm -hmm. So we all enjoy the harvest, but it's the other stuff that really uh, creates patience in us and I believe brings us closer to God. So I appreciate that. Yes, um, now, you've obviously lived through some persecution in the workplace. Uh, you lived your life in the public sector, which it seems like anymore, you know, the public sector is not very warm for religion in general. Uh, for others who are either in the public or private sector, uh, what does living out your faith look like on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, what can you tell our listeners uh, about how to go about doing that? Yeah, I want to use a couple of my biblical heroes as examples. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they entered into Babylon standing on their faith. Daniel, their colleague, entered into Babylon standing on their faith. They realized that they were going to be serving in a nation and for a government that didn't believe what they believed. And they took a stand and say, we don't want to eat the king's food. You know, give us 10 days. We're going to fast 
We're just going to drink water and eat vegetables. And if our work and our intellect diminishes, then we'll do what you want us to do. But if it doesn't, let us do what our beliefs say we should do. And at the end of that 10 days, they were more remarkable than even the other Jewish guys who didn't take the stand that they right. that they took. Well, when you look at the rest of that book, their life went to a whole nother level in the government. Even though Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced persecution, of course, the fiery furnace, after mm -hmm. the fiery furnace, persecution because they wouldn't bow down, they were promoted to governors. Uh, after Daniel came out of the lion's den, he was made a prime minister. So there is possible to live out our faith in the marketplace and even in the government. Like I was a government employee. That's why I chose those guys as examples. Right. I was a government employee. And what I saw what God did in the lives of those government employees, it gave me confidence that God was with me. Through my persecution, when I was terminated, God gave, he elevated me to the chief operating officer of Elizabeth Baptist Church. It wasn't a demotion. It was a promotion. Uh, and then after service at Elizabeth Baptist Church, now I'm serving as senior fellow and vice president of Alliance Defending Freedom. He took it to another level. And it really just shows how those seasons of cultivation always lead to a season uh, of harvest in our lives. So it's possible to live out our faith in the marketplace. You don't have to go to work quoting scriptures and passing out tracts. Just let your light shine at work so that your work in and of itself speaks of your faith and the God that's on the inside of you. And that alone will draw people to you to question what is it about you that causes you to be happy under such difficult circumstances or your skills are, uh, seem to have an edge that other people don't have. God makes a distinction in us so that our work and our light draws people to us. And then we have a legal way to present them the gospel right. <laughs> when they ask us about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, one thing that I, I gleaned from the book also, just in your, your leadership style in general, you know, it's it's biblically based. I mean, if you live your life based on biblical principles, if you apply those in the workplace, uh, you naturally are going to do well. I mean, you, would you agree with that? I agree with it wholeheartedly. And, uh, and Scotty, this is where... Uh, Christian leaders who have been in this walk of faith can testify uh, that you just really put in the precepts of the book of Proverbs alone into practice organizationally will cause you to have tremendous success. Uh, God will get the glory and, uh, and it really tells of your faith. Sharing our testimony at work is not against rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. Uh, and one of the things I always did when God appointed me to another assignment in the fire service, when I would introduce myself to the team, I would always start out sharing my testimony. Mm. So they knew the foundation of who I was and what I believed without me evangelizing or proselytizing. Yeah. That's excellent. And that's what we're really trying to get people to do through our ministry is be who they are in Christ 24-7. You know, not just go to church and be that person there. Don't put up facades. Uh, be real. Be who you are. Uh, and it, that doesn't have to be pushy in any way. It never demeans or talks down to other people or classifies people. I mean, we're called to love other people, even the people that are different to us uh, from us, uh, the people who are our enemies, even we're called to love. I think you demonstrated that well. Again, I really encourage people to get the book if they want to see how you live this out on a day-to-day -day basis, because I think the book does a good job of uh, showing that. Uh, one thing in the book that I did want to ask you about is throughout the book, you said there were times when you let things go, things that were not really right, but you, you just chose to, to let those go. And other times you said, no, this is an important issue I need to take a stand on. So what can you tell people about doing that themselves? When, when should they let things go? When should they take a stand? Well, my philosophy on that was based on the great prophet, uh, Kenny Rogers, who said, <laughs> you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away and know when to run. And being one of the first African-Americans on the Shreveport Fire Department, I just had this sense, and I believe it came from the Holy Spirit, that, you know, that every uh, hill is not worth dying on. You've got to be selective 
on how you assert yourself on matters, even on matters of discrimination and racism. Because in my case, I knew that there would be other African Americans coming after me who the way I interacted with my brothers on the Shreveport Fire Department who were white was going to have an influence on how they looked at other African Americans who came after me. So that drove me uh, to really, really filter what I responded to and what I did not respond to. Uh, There are some things that you just can't ignore, you know, those direct attacks on your character, you know, those attacks that actually speak to uh, a a deeper level of um, misinterpretation of who you are as a person. You have to, you know, act on those things. Uh, But the jokes and the slurs and sleeping in a separate bed, you know, uh, a lot of those things I just let go. Uh, God made promises um, that when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he'll make enemy, even his enemies to be at peace with him. I cling to that even today, but I certainly clung to it to know so many other scriptures in the book of Proverbs that tell you how to respond in situations like that. And um, by the grace of God, those scriptures and precepts were my God. And God did what he promised that he would do. Uh, I became the first African-American fire chief of the Shreveport Fire Department in 18 years, which in and of itself is miraculous. Um, And many of the men who were treating me like that when I was a rookie, uh, by the grace of God, they became my brothers and my friends by that time. Mm -hmm. And those who did not, they were working for me and they had to follow my orders, my direction which were all in accordance with the rules, regulations, policies, and procedures, I got a chance to demonstrate to them that this is not a moment for retaliation for me. This is a moment to demonstrate godly leadership, that the rules and policies we have in place are just if they apply to everybody in spite of their race, their gender, whether they have a mom or a daddy on the fire department Mm -hmm, and those other mm -hmm, kinds of things. mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Well, we're about out of time. I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, thank you for your service as a firefighter. Uh, you've served uh, well and honorably and served the people of Shreveport and Atlanta well and served all the people in the U.S. as your role there. We greatly appreciate that. I appreciate your leadership, appreciate what you stand for, appreciate you sharing this time with us today. I just encourage people uh, to do what you said. Go to ADF's website, sign up for the prayer initiative, uh, get involved with ADF in general. You know, as far as taking the stand goes, I think Christians too long in, in the U.S. have been silent on some issues, and we need, to, we need to take a stand. ADF, I think, is leading in that. It provides us an opportunity to get on, to get involved at a level which is appropriate for us, right? Everybody, yeah. everybody can't serve in the role you're in. Everybody can't uh, be a lawyer or what, what have you, but there is something everybody can do even if that's just praying, which shouldn't be, I shouldn't say even if you can just pray because that is a key part. Yeah. Uh, anything you would just like to close out with uh, for our listeners? Well, thank you, Scotty. I was about to say I'd be remiss if I didn't share uh, with those believers who uh, are concerned about what would happen if I publicly lived out my faith. And uh, I've discovered that there are five things that all believers should know. Uh, when they face, not if they face the date where they'll be tested as to whether or not they'll stand for Christ, not if it happens, but when it happens. The first thing that believers need to understand is that God always prepares his sons and daughters for that moment. You, You wouldn't be facing that moment if God had not determined that he had properly equipped you for it. That's number one. Number two is the toughest of the five lessons there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. And when we accept that on the front end, when the moment comes, we're more courageous. When we try to ignore it, and then that moment comes, many times we are cowards instead of courageous. So we need to understand and accept the reality. There are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. But we should encourage by the third lesson, there are kingdom consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. And the kingdom consequences 
are always greater than the worldly consequences. Amen. The challenge is most believers don't get past number two so that they can experience number three. We allow the fear of the worldly consequences to cause us to bow down rather than rejoicing in the kingdom consequences and standing so that we can get to see the other side, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, and those other believers. The fourth lesson is when we have the courage and grace to stand, um, God is glorified in two ways. Our enemies get to see a side of God that they would have never seen had we not stood. And the other part is even better. We get to see a side of God that we <laughs> would not have seen yes. if we had not stood. And the fifth lesson is for the son or daughter of God who has the courage and grace to stand in that moment, their life of blessing goes to a whole nother level that's exceeding abundantly above all they could ever ask or think. Mm -hmm. We see that in every single case in the Bible, in Job's case, in Daniel's case, in Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego case, Joseph's case, Mary's case, Ruth's case, Esther's case, all every every person that has courage to stand, God takes their life to a whole nother level. And I'm sitting here today humbly as living proof of the very same truth. Yeah, that, that's that's great. I hope people are taking notes on that. Uh, you know, too often we have this narrow view uh, of what we think life should be. We don't turn it over to God. But when we do, it's just it's what you said. Uh, he abundantly ab blesses us above what we could ask or think. So why aren't we trying to figure it out? You know, just be faithful to what he's be called faithful. us to, exactly like what you said. We don't think, we think those people in the Bible are just stories that's never going to happen to us. Right. We don't realize if we will do the same things they have done, model our life that way, right. there's no reason that God won't. I do the same things for us. He's the exact same God. And Jesus said it this way. And I just I just think that when I'm about to say this, I just think of how we just don't believe it. Jesus said, whoever is persecuted for my name, mm -hmm. whatever you lose, I will restore it 100 fold. What Jesus was saying is, whatever you lose, I'll restore it to be 100 times greater than what it was you lost. And so mm -hmm. he said, if you lose a house, I'll give you a house a hundred times better than the one. If you lose your wife or your son or your daughter, I'll restore them, even your kids, <laughs> a hundred times better than the ones that you lost. He said, you will not lose anything standing for me that mm -hmm. I will not restore in this life mm -hmm. a hundred times greater. I'm living, I'm living proof of that, Scotty. Amen. Today, Jesus was not using hyperbole Mm. He was telling the truth. Very good. That's a good note to yeah. end on right there. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing each of you again soon. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.